Every generation grows up with a different ecosystem, with a different lake. Because the lake is changing over time. So while the water is as clear as ever, that doesn't necessarily mean it's cleaner than ever. And in fact, it's not the sign of a healthy lake, it's the sign of a lake that's getting the life sucked out of it. The sucking comes from two organisms that don't belong in the lake. They entered the Great Lakes in the late 1980s in the ballast water of ocean-going ships. And they feed on algae that used to support the entire food web. They're called zebra and quagga mussels. These tiny bivalves now blanket the bottom of Lake Michigan. And the effect of their feeding is enormous. One of these can filter more than one liter or one quart of water per day. Um, now one quart is a drop in the bucket for Lake Michigan. But if you figure that on the bottom of Lake Michigan, you can have anywhere between 5,000 and 10,000 of these mussels in one square meter. We're talking trillions, probably quadrillions of these things just smothering the lake bottom and, 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 and totally rewiring the way energy flows through the lakes. If you do the math, what it tells you is that these mussels have the capacity to filter all of the water in Lake Michigan within a couple of weeks. What they're filtering out are the tiny plants and animals at the base of the food web. And that's changed everything. Yeah, uh, it's, it's just a different lake. It's a, it's a dramatically different lake than it was even 20 years ago. To understand what's happened, let's look at a simplified version of Lake Michigan's food web. At the base of the food web are microscopic algae known as phytoplankton. These tiny algae support all the larger fish in the lake. Phytoplankton grow by absorbing sunlight and nutrients. A key nutrient in this story is phosphorus. It supports the growth of phytoplankton, which, as we've learned, support the entire food web. We'll talk more about phosphorus in a minute. Before quagga mussels invaded, the phytoplankton and the phosphorus they absorbed were eaten by tiny animals known as zooplankton. The zooplankton were eaten by small and medium-sized fish. At the top of the food web were the big fish, like native lake trout, and stocked fish, like Chinook salmon, that have made Lake Michigan's sport fishery world famous. The actual food web is rather more complicated. But the basic idea is that before quagga mussels, the phytoplankton at the base supported salmon and trout at the top. Let's look for a minute at that phosphorus. It occurs naturally in the environment, but Lake Michigan receives a lot of extra phosphorus when it runs off of farm fields where it's used as fertilizer. It also flows in from suburban yards and golf courses, urban areas, and from sewage treatment plants. In the 1960s, phosphorus levels got so high that they boosted the growth of algae. When the algae broke off and washed ashore, it rotted on the beaches. And decomposing algae almost completely killed off Lake Erie, another of the Great Lakes. In 1972, the Clean Water Act reduced the amount of phosphorus allowed in the Great Lakes. Targets were set for phosphorus input to the lakes. These allowed optimum amounts of phytoplankton to grow while keeping the nuisance algae under control. And it worked. For about four decades, the system was more or less stable, and the sport fishery flourished. Now, zebra and quagga mussels have changed everything. They eat much of the phytoplankton, and thus the phosphorus in the phytoplankton, at the bottom of the food web. The consequences ripple to the top. Intermediate level fish starve, 
and so do salmon, trout, and other big predators at the top. In areas close to shore, the phosphorus in the waist of the mussels once again supports the growth of algae on the lake bottom. As in the 1960s, some of these algae eventually break off and wash ashore. There they rot in stinking masses and harbor harmful bacteria. So we face a trade-off. We can try to reduce phosphorus inputs to the lake even more than we already have, hoping this will reduce the amount of nuisance algae near shore. But less phosphorus in the lake would probably mean even less plankton in the offshore waters. And that would mean fewer big fish. How much phosphorus, then, should be allowed into the lake? To answer that, managers need to know precisely how the system works. What exactly would be the effects of allowing, say, 20% less phosphorus into the lake? Right now, on board this very ferry, Harvey Bootsma and his students are conducting research to find out. Bootsma is using the ferry to make thousands of measurements of phytoplankton abundance in various parts of the lake. We've really benefited from collaborating with the Lake Express because they cover a large section of Lake Michigan going all the way from Wisconsin to Michigan several times a day. So by having monitoring equipment on the Lake Express, we can literally have our, our, our finger on the pulse of Lake Michigan to see how it's changing from day to day and even from hour to hour. Bootsma and his students combine that information with other samples from the lake. Then they spend a lot of time in the lab analyzing that data. The measurements allow Bootsma to understand the way Lake Michigan is responding to phosphorus inputs. We used to have mathematical models that told us if you put this much phosphorus into Lake Michigan, this is how much plankton you will have in the lake, and if you have this much plankton in the lake, this is how much fish the lake can support. Those relationships have now changed. Bootsma and his team are trying to find out what the new models look like. If a certain amount of phosphorus is allowed into Lake Michigan, how much plankton will be produced and where will it be? How many fish would the lake support? And will some fish species do better than others? It's all about knowing how the new food web in Lake Michigan will respond to management choices. Do people want to see more of Lake Michigan's native fish, such as lake trout and whitefish and walleye? Or would they prefer to see more of the Pacific salmon that are so much fun to catch? Or is there a middle way that could support some of each? Those priorities are probably going to be different for different people. So I think it's important for managers and policymakers to, to get feedback not only from people who are very outspoken and spending all of their time on the lake, but from the broader community of, of people who live around the Great Lakes to determine what uh, are our values as a society and how do we balance those different values to develop management plans that find a balance among those values. Lake Michigan continually changes. It is never going back to how it was before Europeans settled its shores. Managing the lake, deciding what fish we stock and what amounts of phosphorus we allow into it, depends on an accurate understanding of how this complicated system works. By supporting research into these questions, the Lake Express is making a valuable contribution to that understanding.